All right, so in terms of the objectives for today's lecture, I was um, hoping to just kind of do a little bit of a discussion about parasitic infections, kind of setting the stage, um, some of the keys with respect to transmission, and um, then reviewing the common internal intestinal parasites of cats and dogs, uh, highlighting life cycles and transmission, diagnostic tests, and treatments that might be practical for a shelter um, setting. So just to get a sense, how many of you have had parasitology at some point in your life? Okay, so that's kind of what I was thinking is that some of us have had more of this than others and so we're just gonna, we're gonna dive right in but um, if you are completely lost, just give me a, a sign and I'll try and um, rephrase what I've said. So the plan for today is to review some key concepts in parasitology and transmission. Um, talk about common inte intestinal parasites of cats and dogs. Why are they common? Do, why do we treat them? Um, do we need to and with what? Um, and how do we diagnose them? And how do we prevent transmission? And I'm hoping that at some point we're gonna make this a little bit more interactive because I don't really like talking to large groups of people. So, <laughs> so, um, so we're gonna start off with defining what it is that, um, that a parasite is. So some people think of parasites as just any infectious agent, like bacteria, viruses, prions, and eukaryotes, um, which is where we're gonna re restrict our view. So we're restricting our view to exclude viruses and bacteria and prions, and really looking at animals that are parasitic. Um, and the other important concept is parasitic relationships are just a form of symbiosis. They're just one animal living in association with another animal. Um, and that is the most common mode of being in the world is associations with, with hosts, with other animals. So by definition, a parasite is something that damages the host, that um, has an association that's detrimental. So that's the definition, but we know that that's a blurry line, so it's all about balance. Animals can do okay with some of these organisms living on them, and of course, it could depend on the type of organism that we're talking about. But we generally, when we say parasite, we immediately think bad, but that's not always the case because that is a blurry line. Okay, so key concepts with respect to prevalence of parasites and transmission. They're gonna be influenced by population density, that, which influences itself um, how many hosts are available, what the contamination of the environment is gonna be, right? Because a lot of parasites get transmitted out in feces or in ur urine. Um, and then um, the number of infected individuals within that population, if you have lots and lots, then obviously transmission is gonna be increased. If you have fewer of them, then transmission is gonna be a little bit harder. So geographic region definitely is going to impact what kinds of parasites are present. And also there's behaviors that can either increase or decrease the chances that animals are parasitized. So for cats and dogs, that's going to include hunting. That's a biggie. Um, coprophagy. So I don't know if you guys can see it in the back, but this says, uh, I poop in dark bedrooms. And the other one <laughs> says, and I eat the evidence. So <laughs> dogs have a tendency, we don't like this of course, but dogs have a tendency to eat poop. Um, whether animals have received veterinary care in the past or not is gonna uh, impact how many parasites they have. If you can confine individuals indoors, you can greatly decrease the number of um, exposures that they have. And sanitation, sanitation is number one as well. So, Presence or access to vectors, so arthropods that can um, transmit parasites or uh, hosts that are considered intermediate or paratenic, just meaning prey species that um, are also necessary for the life cycles to be completed, and clean uncontaminated water. All of this stuff is kind of mixed into how likely is it that animals are gonna have a parasite. So, the number one mode of transmission for parasites in general is gonna be ingestion of parasites, and that can be either in prey tissue, um, including blood, so carnivorism definitely for cats and dogs, um, or parasite stages from the environment. And those things are things that have evolved over time um, and are defined by or guided by host feeding preferences. 
There's a key concept in transmission um, that has to do with host association and specificity. So these host parasite relationships have evolved over lots and lots of time. They've been tuned to, um, to be um, more likely when exposures are, are the most likely. Uh, so they're essentially it's going back to what we've been talking about, right? That they've been guided by host behaviors. I massacred that thought, so did you guys follow that? <laughs> okay, thank you. That totally did not come across the way it was in my head, but I'm glad you're, you're giving me the benefit of the doubt. All right, so, and then another really important thing here, and I, you guys probably know all this, but just so it gets it, you know, from where I'm thinking, um, they differ from bacteria and viruses. Most parasites are not going to be in readily infected. So, you know, that kid sneezes on you and you're like, oh, I just got a cold. But that's not the way that roundworms or hookworms or things like that are going to be transmitted. There are very few parasites that are, are readily infective when they come out in the feces. So they require maturation in the environment to get to, the, um, to infect other hosts. And that maturation can be a long period of time. So we're usually talking days to weeks for many of the worms that we're dealing with. So opportunities to intervene include good sanitation, prevention of predation, making sure that there's no vectors or arthropods that are um, gaining access to the, to the animals, and then treatments and vaccines. It's hard sometimes to define what we mean by significant, right? So sometimes it may be something that makes an animal very sick. That would be a significant parasite. Or maybe it's significant not because it makes the animal sick, but because it might make us sick. So it's a zoonotic. Um, or they could be significant just because we never see them here. So it may not be a significant parasite with respect to the population that we're dealing with um, because, you know, it's a rarity, but it's, it's pretty impressive that it's there, um, you know, sometimes. Um, and then we always have to consider, because we know that parasitism is just a form of symbiosis, and because we know that animals can do okay with a certain number of parasites, at least the common ones usually, we have to consider who is most likely to have disease associated with those parasites. And so animals that are most likely individuals, because this includes people too, with respect to their own parasites, they're most likely to have disease um, and the higher number of parasites if you are young, if you don't have an immune system that's very competent and working well, if you haven't had good nutrition and you're malnourished, if you're stressed, or if you or they are already diseased. All right, so common intestinal parasites. I have six I'm going to go over with you guys. I want you guys to just shout out some that you know. Roundworms. Tapeworms. Giardia, whips. Coccidia. I have a vote for Toxo. Does anybody else want to second Toxo? Yes. Toxoplasma? What was that? Lepto, we're going to stay away from because it's not a parasite, so that's my sidestep. <laughs> Giardia, yeah, we got Giardia. Um, okay, and I think you guys said tapeworms, so I think you've got them all. So, roundworms, hookworms, whipworms. Tapeworms, Giardia, and Coccidia. That's what I'm going to cover with you guys. I didn't have Toxoplasma on there. I considered it for a second because, is it common? Yes. Is it intestinal? Sometimes. So it's intestinal in the first time that the cat gets infected. The first time they get that parasite, they're going to have tissue stages and intestinal stages. The intestinal stages lead to the um, stages that get shed in the feces that contaminate the environment, but they only do that once, and then they're done for life. Unless they get severely immunosuppressed, so they get really, really sick, their immunity wanes, they may shed oocysts again, or if they, you know, uh, like say my cat, I get my cat from the shelter, <coughs> been exposed to Toxoplasma because it had been hunting, right? I bring him indoors. He's not allowed to eat any more prey because I'm a parasitologist. He's not allowed outside. And then a mole gets in the house. 
I get unlucky enough seven years later that the mole gets in the house, the cat eats it, the mole had toxoplasma, my cat may shed for a little bit, but it's going to be short. So the takeaway is toxoplasma shedding from cats is not common. It will be by population, maybe you could argue that it is. So if we have young animals that have just started hunting, then toxoplasma oocysts shedding in the feces will be common in that population. But population of cats in general, you're not going to have high numbers of oocysts exiting the body. Make sense? So they'll be infected, and you'll find antibodies, because they have that in their, in their tissue, but they're not going to be shedding them in feces. All right. So why are these things common? Well, as we talked about, life cycles of parasites are honed to ensure transmission. So they can have huge numbers of eggs and oocysts and stages being passed in the feces to contaminate the environment and make sure everybody gets infected. And that's true with all six of the parasites that were listed on that slide. The parasite stages in the environment might be extremely long-lived. Um, this is especially true of roundworms and whipworms. So they, the eggs can live out in the environment for eight to 10 years. Once they're in soil, I know, you should be gasping with horror. <laughs> so these things are shedding Toxicara, which is our roundworm. They're shedding 20,000 eggs per day, each female at maximum shedding. So you can imagine that this accumulation of eggs in the environment is pretty significant. So once those eggs are out there, as I tell my vet students, we're pretty much screwed. Um, so they're also capable of infecting prey for rounds, hooks, tapeworms, and coccidia. That is true. So when animals eat prey species, when cats and dogs eat prey species, they may get these parasites. And then they're also um, capable of transmission to their young vertically. So roundworms and hookworms and puppies have that vertical transmission from mom to, to puppy. And the other reason they're common is, for the most part, treatment is not going to be curative with respect to completely er eliminating the parasite from the body of the animals. So one-time treatment is not going to remove the entire population of parasites. And the parasites that aren't resumed for uh, removed for some of these are going to uh, resume their development. And as we know, of course, reinfection is also common. So we're going to start off with roundworms. Um, and Toxicara species are the most common. So you guys probably can't see this in the back, but I'll do a little interpretive dance of our, our life cycle here. But roundworms are going to be present in the intestine, in the small intestine of animals, um, as adult parasites. And they're making these long-lived eggs that are passed in the feces. The eggs are not infective. They take two weeks, at least, in the environment to become infectious. So they have to be in the environment for at least two weeks. Usually by then, the feces has fallen apart. The eggs get incorporated into the soil. So a lot of times I ask my students, how, do parasite, how does toxic care get transmitted? And they'll say fecal oral. And if you say fecal oral to me, I'll give you the yes but spiel, which goes as follows. Yes, they're passed in the feces. Yes, you have to e eat the eggs later. But there's that two-week period of time in the environment. So really, it has to be old poop. Um, and then Toxicara has four possible routes of transmission for dogs. So they can eat those larvated eggs from the environment, or they can eat prey species, including earthworms and cockroaches, that have larvae in them. Um, or they can have transplacental transmission, which is the most common mode of transmission. So that puppy, that cute little puppy comes at you. He's a bag of worms. He's a cute bag of worms. Um, he's got round worms and he's got hookworms. He can't help it. He's got them from mom. Um, and then, so what did I say? Soil, oh, transmammary transmission is the least likely mode of transmission for Toxicara, but it's a possibility. Um, for cats, we drop the transplacental transmission. So vertical transmission for roundworms and cats is not as likely as it is for dogs. There is a, a possibility for them to get it in milk from mom, but it's not as likely as for um, that vertical transmission for dogs. So as I mentioned, all puppies are infected. Most kittens are actually going to get infected once they start eating prey, but there is a possibility for them to get it from mom and then eggs from the environment as well, as I mentioned. 
And the thing that I want you guys to remember is they're going to have larvae that are arrested in tissue. So they're going to have immature worms that aren't in the intestine that are just going to get into the muscle and they're going to hang out. They're just going to be like, okay, now I'm going to go to sleep and wake me up later. And so when you treat an animal, when you give them drugs, you can remove the adult populations in the intestine. You can remove some of the immatures. We're not going to get the ones that are asleep. They're just not active enough to be affected by the drugs. So there's always the possibility that we're leaving behind some worms in there. And as I mentioned before, the eggs are really long-lived. Uh, any questions for roundworms? Because I'm shifting on you now. Okay. All right, so hookworms. Um, so mainly these are Ancelostoma species, uh, which is the most common and important one of the, of the hookworms. And there's many routes of transmission for this one too, so another reason why they're very common. You can get vertical transmission from mom to pup in the milk. So we make the assumption every puppy is infected. They can get out into the environment and they also have to mature. So you can't get hookworms from, um, from dog feces that's fresh. They have to hatch. The larvae have to be in the environment for about a week. And then once they're mature larvae in the environment, they can either penetrate skin they can ingest those larvae from the environment um, by eating grass or maybe they're playing around out there and then they lick their paws and they get L3 in that way. Or they can eat it in prey species. Again, um, mammals, birds, cockroaches, and earthworms. Um, and so those are the four routes of transmission for dogs. Skin penetration, third stage larvae, which is the infective stage from the environment um, in prey or in milk. Cats, no vertical transmission. So cats generally get infected when they start hunting, um, but all puppies are gonna be infected. And again, as with roundworms, larvae are gonna be present in the tissue. So we can't remove those larvae until they reactivate and get into the intestine. Uh, and that's just for cats. So cats also shed non-infective eggs in the environment. They hatch, larvae mature. The larvae can then do skin penetration, ingestion, and actually they don't do great skin penetration, but it's a possibility. They're just not very good at it. Um, they eat the larvae from the environment or they eat prey that has those larvae in them. Any questions for hookworms? Okay. Whipworms. Cat species of whipworms exist, but they're not very common in the U.S. We might start to see them more as more and more cats come in from the Caribbean. Um, so we're starting to see some in like Florida, et cetera, but the dog whipworm is much more common. Single route of transmission. The only way that dogs can get infected is through ingestion of eggs from the environment. And again, this is one of the ones where if you tell me fecal oral, you're going to get the yes but spiel. These have to be out in the environment for at least a month. So it has to be really, really old poop. Um, and the eggs can last for eight to 10 years, as we talked about. They have a three-month prepatent period. What that means is it's three months between when the dog eats that infective egg and when they start putting e the worms develop to the point where they can start putting eggs out in their feces and you can detect it. If you give them a single treatment, you're not going to remove them. There's a possibility that if they didn't get reinfected and you treated them once a month for three months, then you could remove them all because by then the assumption is that they would, you would have gotten all of the uh, stages that had been in there previously. Questions about whipworms? All right, just flag me down if you, if you do have a question. Um, tapeworms. There's two big groups of tapeworms in cats and dogs that are common, tenia species and dipolidium. Tenia species in dogs and cats um, have to be acquired through ingestion of prey. Uh, and it has to be a mammal. The most common is Tenia pisiformis in dogs, which goes through rabbits. So they literally have to eat the rabbit and the baby tapeworm in it to get infected with the adult tapeworm in the intestine. For cats, it's the same scenario, except that you, that you meaning the cat, <laughs> except that the cat is eating a mouse um, to get infected. So if you see tenia in a cat or a dog, it tells you that that animal has been eating prey. And as I tell my students, if you see tenia in a cat, it's another check mark that, yep, you've got a cat because it's eating prey. Um, and then dipolidium is 
cats and dogs, and they acquire that through ingestion of fleas. So usually you guys remember there's a flea tapeworm, um, and that usually can help you remember that for all tapeworms, you have to have what we call an intermediate host. It's a key host that they have to eat to get infected, otherwise they can't get infected. So there's only one route of transmission for cats and dogs, and that is ingestion of either prey or fleas. And a single treatment should be curative. There's an asterisk there because now we're seeing some um, tapeworms that we're having a hard time treating. So there may be an indication that um, there may be some resistance to our dewormers out there. Yes? Mm -hmm. So the question is re regarding the uh, prepatent period for tapeworms and, and dipalidium specifically, that it was about three months. I've seen literature that says as little as a month for, for that one. Yeah. Yep. Okay. And then when I said, which are common, you guys all yelled Giardia at me. Um, so yes, Giardia. And I'm going to put what I prefer up there. So Giardia felis and Giardia canis. I don't buy this whole thing about Giardia, and I'm not crazy by myself. There's also others that are with me on this. Um, so we often talk about Giardia from people and animals all lumped in together. They used to be different species, and then they lumped them all together. And now, by looking at them by molecular means, we're starting to tease them out again. Bottom line is, don't eat cat and dog poop, but you're not going to get Giardia from cats and dogs. Um, so Giardia in animals and in people is a commensal. There's got to be a few of us in this room that have Giardia. We just do. They're commensals. Um, it's just we generally don't all go out and start running fecals on ourselves, right, until we get, <laughs> we get sick, and then it's like, oh, you have Giardia and you have the runs, therefore. But it's not that way. It's just sometimes it was there already. Sometimes it does cause disease, however, as it says there, to remind me to say that. Um, there's a single route of transmission. It's, transmission, it's fecal oral, and it can be immediate transmission. So of those parasites that we're talking about now, Giardia cysts are readily infective. So that dog that's eating the other dog's poop can get infected with Giardia if he didn't already have it himself. And the cysts can be long-lived. We're not talking eight to 10 years, but if you get them into cool water, they can persist for about a year or so. Treatment is challenging in cats and dogs, um, and we'll come back to this. And then coccidia. So these are Cystoisospora species. Coccidia, just like Giardia, is host-associated. Um, and actually, for coccidia, it's so specific, so you're definitely, definitely not going to get coccidia from cats and dogs. Um, there's very large numbers of oocysts, which is the transmission stage that are produced and shed into the environment. All age groups, age groups can be infected. However, um, it's going to be the young ones that are uh, um, most affected, so that may have clinical signs. Um, immunity is not going to be protective. I'll come right to you for a second. Um, it's not going to be protective, therefore you can get reinfection, but immunity is, so it's not protective against reinfection, but it, immunity is protective against disease. Sorry, there was a question that I yeah, um, tried to ignore. The, no, the, the first thing you said, um, that the coccidia. Yeah. So coccidia, the question is with, with respect to coccidia and whether cats can get it for dogs. Um, from dogs. So cats cannot get it from dogs and dogs can't get it from cats and we don't get it from either of them. So everybody, all hosts, all animals have their own version of coccidia and they can't be transmitted amongst them. Which actually reminds me, because I just said that, oftentimes I get um, people coming in and they tell me that the dog has rabbit coccidiosis and they have to treat it. That's not a thing, guys. It's, they can have osis in their feces, the imeria, from eating rabbit poop. It can be present in the feces, but that doesn't mean that you need to treat it. It's going in one end, out the other, no infection in between. All it's telling you is, I'm a happy dog, I'm eating rabbit poop. <laughs> um, so for coccidia, there's two routes of transmission, direct from eating osis from the environment, and these are not readily infective. They take a couple of days to get to the infective stage, just like toxoplasma. 
um, and ingestion of prey is the other way. Oasis can be long lived in the environment, so again, we're talking probably about a year or so if they get into cool water. And then treatment of coccidia is really to prevent other animals from becoming infected. So if you have an animal that has coccidia and it's shedding large numbers, you're gonna try to give coccidia stats to the other animals that are in the same age group to help prevent them from having clinical disease associated with them. Okay, so why do we treat and do we need to? And with what? Why do we treat? We treat because sometimes the animals have clinical signs associated with it. So you might be treating the disease or you might wanna be preventing disease from happening. Um, parasitism is additive. Anything going on with the animal, if it, in addition to that, has a parasite and one that has the potential to cause disease is more likely to cause disease in that individual, right? So um, you start taxing the animal with more and more, more issues, they're more likely to have disease. We might be wanting to mitigate zoonoses. So some of these parasites are uh, potentially infective to people, and therefore we don't want any eggs being passed in the environment that could infect us. And sometimes we're just looking to um, protect the human-animal bond. So um, importance of roundworms. We have big worms. This is proportional to the animal, right? But these are big worms that are present in the small intestine. So the adults are large and they can block the intestine. They can rupture the intestine or cause impactions. And the other really important thing is they can compete with the host for nutrients. So the largest number of adult worms are gonna be present in the young animals. Young animals need all their nutrients to grow and there's this competition for those nutrients. Then you're gonna have you know, uh, young animals that have ill thrift, poor hair coat, pot-bellied appearance. Um, and um, you also have migration of the larvae. So when, when animals ingest eggs from the environment, the larvae actually leave the gut, they go to the liver, then they go to the lungs, then they get coughed up and swallowed, and then they return to the intestine. Um, so that going through the lungs could also make it such that you could have some uh, respiratory signs. Young and malnourished animals are the ones that are most likely to be, um, to have clinical signs or to have disease. And adult animals um, can be infected, very usually they are infected, but they may not have any disease. So they're just shedding either eggs or infecting their pups. And Toxicariasis, the infection with Toxicara, is one of the, neglect, the five neglected parasitic infections of Americans. We are at 14% seroprevalence in Americans, so Toxicara gets into us. It is most closely tied, of course, through soil to poverty, so it is our job to make sure that cats and dogs have zero eggs ending up in the environment that could potentially infect people. Um, routine and helminthic therapies, so treating animals, as we've talked about before, aren't gonna remove all of those arrested larvae and tissues. Therefore, we need to make sure that we're treating them routinely, such that any of those little worms that we missed the first time, that were arrested in tissue and quote unquote sleeping, if they've reactivated, you get them the next time you're gonna give that monthly preventive. And then the recommendation would be that puppies and kittens get started with treatment at two weeks of age, and then every two weeks until you can put them on a preventative for heartworm disease that, um, that would kill roundworms and hookworms. And essentially what we're saying is treat them for life every time of the year um, or all times of the year um, and deworm them every month. So our goals are to reduce the population of worms in that animal over time um, and of course prevent reinfections. And um, through reducing those populations, we're gonna reduce the risk of disease in that animal, and we're also preventing contamination of the environment with eggs that might infect either other animals or people. Make sense? Okay. Um, so the kinds of treatments that are out there, fenbendazole, milbamycin oxime, moxidectin, pyrantal, are things that are approved for all of the roundworms, so Toxicara canis, T. cati, and Toxascris. Fibantil um, can also be used, and that's, that's what's in Drontal and Drontal Plus. 
And paparazine is um, approved, but it doesn't seem to have the same efficacy as some of the other products. Pyrantal is pretty palatable and can be given as a liquid um, for, for nursing animals, so that tends to be the, the preferred treatment for young pups and kittens. Um, nursing animals, probably know this stuff, um, should be treated at the same time, for roundworms at the same time as their litters, and then, because um, you can get that immunosuppression in greater numbers of adult worms and greater numbers of eggs being produced. And then pregnant animals can be treated, but this is off-label, so you're going to need to have your veterinarian come up with a, with a protocol for that if you want to do that. In cats, you have the same sorts of things, bilbomycin oxime, moxidectin, parental pamoate that can remove T. cati and or toxascris. Um, Selamectin, febantil, and imidepside are also um, good for cats, and paparazine, as we mentioned, can be used, but doesn't seem to be as efficacious. Um, pyrantal, again, because it can be, it's quite palatable and you can have it in a liquid formulation is what uh, is the kind of go-to for treatment of kittens. Um, and although the prepatent period for roundworms is not until six weeks, because there's a likelihood that they're going to have hookworms, and hookworms are, um, the prepatent period for that is as little as two weeks, um, the recommendation is start them at two weeks deworming them at two weeks for roundworms and hookworms, um, and then every two weeks until you can put them onto a preventive and deworm them monthly. And then finally, nursing queens, um, you're going to want to uh, deworm them at the same time as their litters. So the question is with respect to doses, and I should have started off with not a veterinarian, <laughs> so I'm not going to talk about doses, but um, there's really good protocols out there already, and I'm sure I can get you one if you, if you need the dosing for, for young animals. And I know we have a couple of our vets, so if you want to um, remind me at the end, and they can tell you. All right, so um, hookworms. The main importance with respect to these guys is blood loss, and there's two modes of blood loss. One is primary, so the, the worms themselves, hopefully you can see this in the back, they have these really uh, impressive teeth. They're going in there, they're biting off chunks of mucosa, they're depositing um, anticoagulants so that you can't get clotting, and then they get bored with that site, and they're like, I'm going to go feed over here. So they leave that site behind bleeding. Um, and so you're getting blood loss both from them sucking it in and then leaving it bleeding behind, which can lead then to anemia. You can have diarrhea with tarry stools um, and young and undernourished animals as well as small breeds are the most likely to have clinical signs associated with this because they can't replenish their red blood cells as effectively. Um, and so adults uh, that are otherwise in good health usually are infected but may not be affected. There are zoonotic implications, mainly with the version that's in beaches. So for most of us that don't get to leave um, Ithaca, um, it's not as big a deal, but Ancelastoma brasiliensis is the one that has a tendency to cause cutaneous larva migrants. The others could potentially have some, some risk for that, so we just lump them all in together. Um, as we talked about, you're not going to remove all of the, the larvae and tissue. And the recommendations, as we mentioned before, start deworming puppies at two weeks and every two weeks until you can put preventive use in order to decrease the number of worms in the animal, reduce, therefore, the chances that they have clinical disease. And our number one go goal with respect to public health is make sure that there's no eggs ending up in the environment. Um, for, there's different products or different drugs that are labeled for different parasites. So Ancelostoma caninum, fenbendazole, uh, milbomycin oxime, moxidectin, pyrantal pamoate are approved. On scenario, stenocephala is our Yankee hookworm that's in um, northern climates in dogs. Pyrantal pamoate, fenbendazole, and moxidectin are approved for that one. Ancelostoma brasiliensi, the only one approved is uh, parental pamoate. And then some of them can also get some immature worms. Um, so moxidectin can get immature and fourth stage larvae of um, Ancelostoma canina and on scenario stenocephala. 
And just remember that if you do have animals that are severely affected, not only do you want to try and kill the worms, but you have to keep the animals alive, <laughs> step one, right? Um, so uh, make sure that you're giving supportive therapy as needed. For cats, Imidepside, ivermectin would be additions to the, to the list that we've seen before, and selamectin is also approved for Ancelostoma to be for me. We really don't have much on Cinerea stenocephala um, in our cats, and for fourth stage larvae, imidepside and moxidectine are approved. Yes? So the question is with respect to uh, two-week-old puppies, two-day-old puppies that came in. So the puppies came in, I have to repeat it for the, <laughs> the, the, the puppies came in with the mom, but they weren't old enough to be treated yet, but you were thinking that they were anemic? Or you were thinking roundworms? So treated the mother for the hookworms you, see, you saw on the fecal for, um, for hookworms. Uh, and then at two weeks old, the puppies were dewormed as well and they died. And so the question was whether or not that was blockage. They wouldn't have been blocked from hookworms. The hookworms are only going to be a centimeter in size. Um, there is a possibility that there might have been a blockage with the roundworms because they're pretty big. Oftentimes, when puppies are dying at about two weeks of, old, of age, it may also be the migration um, through the lungs, because when they're born, they'll have the, for toxic hera, for the roundworms, they have the larvae in the liver, and then they migrate all to the lungs, so it could have been respiratory association. It's a little hard to say with the roundworms, yeah. Um, and, you know, they probably had both roundworms and hookworms, so the combination and whatever else was going on was likely too much for them. So supportive care for puppies might, or for any animal that comes in might include, uh, you're going to have to have some indication of what's going on, right? But you need to keep them hydrated and nourished and perhaps replenish blood. Um, if, yeah, yeah. I think that would be a question for the, the veterinarians as to whether you would keep, take them away. My, thought would be no because you're going to need to keep them nourished, but, um, but I'm not sure what they would prefer. For the puppies, you could do, yeah, uh, you could have done a postmortem. You could have seen them in the larvae and histological sections of the lungs, the liver. You could have seen them grossly in the intestine as well. So yeah, that would have given you more information perhaps. All right. Whipworms, the disease is associated with blood loss and leading to anemia. You have bloody stools, perhaps. Sometimes they're not going to be um, having any clinical signs. Weight loss is also a reported sign in those animals that are affected. Um, and young and undernourished animals are the ones that are most likely to be at risk for disease. This is not common in puppies, and the reason why is because of that three-month prepatent period. So, Puppies have to be out in the environment ingesting enough eggs, and then three months later, you're going to see eggs in the feces. You can surely see some uh, disease prior to when you see the eggs in the feces, so, but generally, whipworms are an infection that we associate with older animals rather than younger ones because there's no vertical transmission. There's no zoonotic risk for whipworms, so you can't get whipworms from your dog, even though you can get whipworms from other people. They're just not very common in the U.S. Our goal, again, is to reduce or eliminate that population of worms from the environment. If you treat the dog for one time every three months, um, a month apart, you can definitely uh, do away with the infection as long as they're not getting reinfected. But once you have those eggs in the soil, you're going to have trouble keeping animals from getting reinfected. Um, so approved treatments, Fibantil, Pyrantil, Pamoate, um, and Proziquantil in combination. So that's, again, our Drontal Plus, Fenbendazole, Milbomycin Oxime, um, Moxidectin, and, <coughs> oh yeah, and Milbomycin. So as you might note on there, Ivermectin is not a great choice for this one. Tapeworms, there is little to no disease with that. You can see some annoyance from the segments that literally crawl out of the, the um, anus. Um, so 
these strain the human animal bond and that's why we treat them and there it's that ick factor of oh my gosh my animal has worms um, and if it is dipalidium it may also be evidence of a flea infestation treatments praziquantel and epsiprantel are uh, labeled um, Benbenazole is also approved for uh, tinea pisiformis in dogs and prevention you have to keep them from in either ingesting fleas or ingesting prey oh and that was tapeworms any questions more questions on tapeworms no. all right and then giardia as I mentioned before giardia is a commensal sometimes it does cause diarrhea and the problem is we just don't know what the secret is we don't know when giardia is just kind of hanging out and when giardia is a cause of um, disease or what else is present there that is making us think that giardia sometimes causes disease but if you see disease associated with giardia it's going to be diarrhea and you're going to see it in young animals it is not a fatal infection we consider this a nuisance parasite um, it's hard to treat and it's annoying to have your young puppy or kitten pooping all over the house I hear you I had one it was a pain um, sometimes though we treat because of this incorrect perception of zoonotic potential and it's because we as um, people that know about these things have to be careful and realize that we can't always know everything right so we tell you what we know and then we say but if we want to make sure that you know we don't get any infections in people then let's do such and such so bottom line is there have been no there is no evidence of transmission from cats and dogs to people we have tons of cats and dogs on our counters in our beds and we're not getting evidence of transmission from cats and dogs in Americans I think if there was transmission we'd be able to see it we definitely have evidence that we go hang out in pools and we're going to get infected we go hunt or we go um, camping and drink water from the lake that has all the effluents all the water that comes out of sewage treatment plants we're going to get infected it's not the beavers it's the people um, so again don't eat cat and dog poop but you're not going to get giardia from it um, and just to go even further right you go in, you type Giardia in the CDC, and you're not going to see a cat or dog in that picture. That's people to people. If you eat a whole bunch of cat and dog poop and you want to come and tell me that you got Giardia from it, we'll, we'll have a discussion at that point. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, our goal with respect to treatment is going to be to resolve clinical signs in animals that have them and that you're pretty sure it's Giardia that's causing them. Um, and we do want to protect other susceptible individuals from disease, right? So if your goal is also to reduce the number of cysts that are being shed from an animal, then, then that's fair. Um, we do have this tendency to want to, to have extra protections to protect humans that, have, that are immunosuppressed. So we do say, if you have an animal that has Giardia and you're placing it into a home that has an immunosuppressed individual in it, go ahead and treat it and try and clear it just because it's one less thing that they have to worry about um, so treatment is not warranted unless the animals are clinically affected this is what I would be telling you if you came to me with your pet I realize you're in a shelter situation so again if your goal is to try and keep other animals from getting infected then treatment might be warranted but you have to realize there's two types of um, two stages of the parasite that are inside each animal one is the little flagellated guy that's having fun eating multiplying and then as they get started towards the exit so they start towards the large bowel they put a little cyst around them because they don't do well outside of the body if they're not insisted once they have that cyst on they're not going to be affected by the drug what that means is that dog or cat is a uh, reservoir of infection for himself right so grooming can reinfect them environmental contamination is going to reinfect them you're going to be talking if you really wanted to try and eliminate it you have to do daily baths you have to ensure you know environmental decontamination and even then reinfection is going to be likely 
There's usually a reason why animals are having diarrhea associated with their giardia. It's often some sort of immunity that's not quite there yet. And so oftentimes by the time animals get to be adults, they're going to be okay with their giardia infection. It's just when they're young, they might have a harder time not, because they don't have any immunity yet, um, they might have a harder time fighting off or dealing with that infection. Does that kind of sort of make sense? Yeah. So the question is, do you want to avoid putting kittens into um, areas where older animals are that in a communal cat house? Um, you might want to do that. However, it's very likely that the adults also have Giardia, that they're already... Oh, that the, the adults would give it to the kittens, I see. Um, yeah, but the cats are going to get, the kittens are going to get it at some point anyway. Um, and as long as they're getting it and you're supporting them through it, then they're going to do okay. The other problem with shelters is, of course, that they're under a lot of stress, right? So that can also have um, an impact in how well they can deal with their infections. And so I don't have a lot of uh, answers necessarily for you guys. I'm just trying to give you information that you can then kind of plug into your equations when you're looking at any individual in front of you later on. Um, so coccidia, they're going to be associated with diarrhea, dehydration. Um, young and naive animals, when you crowd them and you stress them out, those are going to be, that's kind of when the stars align and you'll actually have clinical disease or diarrhea associated with coccidia. Otherwise, they just kind of have it. Um, and so reservoirs are going to be common. Uh, cleaning the environment on a regular basis should greatly decrease the numbers of animals that are, that are getting infected. So um, Albon is the only thing that's really, uh, <laughs> you like how I stepped away from trying to say that word? Sulfa drugs <laughs> um, are, is really the only thing that's, that's labeled for the treatment of that enteritis that's associated with coccidiosis, but we do know that pronazoril seems to be pretty effective as well, even though it's not labeled for cats and dogs. Okay, so how do we diagnose these things? Centrifugal flotations. Yes? Sorry, the question was, is treatment warranted in an animal that has coccidia? Um, and the answer is, you might want to treat animals that are susceptible to having diarrhea, which is going to be your young, um, young animals that are stressed and crowded, just so that it prevents them from having the disease. They're going to get infected anyway. So there's a lot of detail as to what the drugs actually act on. Um, and the basic the, the end point to this conversation is treating the animal that's not affected and is shedding osis isn't going to help you very much. What you want to do is prevent the, the disease in those young individuals. So you use it as a prevention for populations rather than an individual treatment. And we can talk about it in more detail if you want to, and I'll try and explain that more. But, um, so diagnostic uh, centrifugal flotations. And I put that in yellow, as you might imagine, on purpose, because I want you guys to realize you have to use a centrifuge if you're going to play with poop, and you're going to float it up, and you're going to look for parasites, which you should, you're going to be spending time, right? So get the most bang for your buck and actually put it in a centrifuge. Putting them in that little um, standing flotation thing is not going to be very successful. If you have to do that, so you're going to tell me, I can't get a centrifuge, I really want to look at it, and I'm, that's the only thing I can do, then let those things sit for 15 to 20 minutes. Taking it off at five minutes, you might as well just be like, oop, I'm not seeing anything, because you're not allowing things to float up. So they don't have good sensitivity. Centrifugal flotations is the way to go. If you're going to do saline wet mounts, you're really only going to do those for flagellates. So if you have little, the little happy trophozoid stages of tritric or giardia, do a wet mount. Otherwise, you're not putting a heck of a lot of feces on a slide and not seeing anything isn't telling you much. Seeing something tells you that it's you know, that's probably present in large numbers. 
So microscopic examination is important. Make sure that you guys that are looking at it um, are the trained and experienced ones, or if you're training somebody else, make sure you're around, because as you probably know, most of us haven't been born staring at poop, and it takes some time to figure out what's a bubble, what's just um, uh, root hairs from plants, etc. So things like this pop up all the time, and I don't know if you guys can see it in the back, but we have a lot of imposters. So we have um, things that look like they have a shell, which they do, but that's pollen. This is, looks like whipworm, but it's not. That's a fungal conidium. Then we have some tapeworm eggs. We have some giardia. This is a parasite, but not of cats and dogs. That's a parasite of earthworms. Goes in one end, out the other. No infection in between for cats and dogs. We can also have um, really, really good imposters like hemlock pollen that looks a lot like Toxicara, especially when Toxicara is infertile. Um, we can have Saccharomycopses, which are uh, non-infective yeast. So bottom line is make sure that, um, that you do look at it and have somebody that is trained um, at looking. And then antigen testing. Please only use this for symptomatic animals because otherwise you're going to get a whole bunch of positives that you may not need to treat um, and pair. So you're going to start to see antigen testing available for hookworms, whipworms, and roundworms. Um, please pair that with a centrifugal flotation. You need to know whether there's eggs there or not to be able to interpret what to do with those animals because as we just talked about you're likely to leave behind immature stages so telling you that there's roundworms in a dog doesn't really by antigen doesn't give you any more information than what you could probably guess already all right preventing transmission in shelters sanitation make sure that you are promptly removing prompt and frequent removal of feces um, you're not going to get much transmission, maybe Giardia, in something that looks like this. You have floors that are not absorptive, you've got no feces in the environment, you're golden with respect to roundworms, hookworms, whipworms, um, coccidia, with respect to transmission in the shelter. The animals might still have it, but you're not going to get other animals um, infected in that shelter. Um, make sure that your water is clean and soil, uh, prevent soil contamination, prevent access to prey, treat and prevent fleas. So you put dogs outside and they're happy in this green grass environment. Yes, it's great for them, but that situation you may potentially get some more transmission. Um, so what's good for the dogs is also good for the parasites, right? And then so soil, um, again, you can get the, if you allow the feces to get incorporated out there, you could set up a, a transmission cycle there as well. And that's it.